Commanding a World War II submarine isn't as complicated as you may think, especially if explained properly. U-Boat will be released in the near future, so let's get ready for it. U-Boat means Unterseeboot, which means submarine. We'll first check out how they fundamentally work, basic subcombat principles, shoot and hit torpedoes and how to navigate. We'll also take a look at difficulty settings and the campaign. Also, Herr Kaloin will always be with us to correct me if I'm wrong. Let's dive in. This is a Type 7 German submarine, or as Herr Kaloin would say, Unterseeboot Typ 7, Ausführung C. It was by far the most built German submarine and also the one you will command in the game. The front is called Bau, the rear is called Stern. There also is the conning tower, from which an officer can con the vessel during a submerged attack. Con is nautical speak for being in charge and commanding people. Above it is the bridge. It's used for surface navigation, signaling and as a lookout. Das hast du besser erklärt als erwartet. Thanks, Herr Kaloin. Inside the main pressure hull are several compartments. First is the bow torpedo room. I guess we all know what a torpedo is and does, so I skipped the explanation. Next is the officer's room. Then comes the listening room, radio room and the captain's cabin. That's the control room. Next up are the petty officer's quarters. Here's the galley, food storage and a toilet. Then there's the diesel engine room. And finally, the stern torpedo room, which also contains the electric motor and two air compressors. These compressors are vital for the U-boat's ability to dive, surface and float. Let me quickly show you how a U-boat moves underwater. There are little movable wings on the bow and stern of the boat called dive planes. They function like an airplane's elevators, but are not enough on their own to fully control the submarine underwater. Because there's buoyancy. For the U-boat to be able to float in a certain depth, or to dive at all, it needs to reduce buoyancy by filling its ballast tanks with water. This now allows the sub to dive. To surface again, this water needs to be removed. The stored compressed air is used to do just that. The water gets blown out and the U-boat surfaces. Your compressed air reservoir is also important if your boat got damaged and water leaked into the pressure hull. Closer to the surface, pumps can be used to get rid of the water. But the deeper you go, the less effective your pumps become. At some point, the outside water pressure gets so high they don't function at all anymore. So, if you're out of compressed air down there to emergency blow your tank, you're done. Außer dein Boot besitzt noch neutralen Auftrieb, du Landrade. That's true. If your boat still has or regains neutral buoyancy, you're able to surface by engine power and dive planes alone. But let's continue. U-boats usually travel large distances on the surface because the diesel engines provide tremendously longer reach than the electric engines. Otherwise, there are three main reasons to dive. A to hide from a plane trying to bomb or strafe your boat, b to listen for propeller noises with the hydrophone, and c to prepare for an attack run after getting into position. So now that we know how a submarine basically functions, let's take our U-boat out for a ride. As you start a new game, you get to select at which point in time to start your career. The later in the war, the harder it gets because you're facing tougher enemies with better equipment to detect and destroy you. Then we need to select a realism setting. Entertaining is like god mode, that's not why you play a simulation. Balanced is a good point to start, even as a complete beginner to submarine simulations, at least after you have watched this tutorial. The enemy AI will be set on medium. You won't have to deal with water entering your boat in strange places, the nights aren't as dark and your torpedoes will function more often than they will not. Also, the game will be more forgiving on high torpedo impact angles. So, sometimes the torpedo still detonates, even if it shouldn't. Next up is the level of crew management. Select minimal here, so you're not being bothered with their morale and other needs like food and sleep. This lets you focus on learning the core mechanics. Once you got these down, 
you can turn crew management back on, which will then add another interesting layer to the simulation. We are now at the port of Wilhelmshaven in the north of the German Reich. Let's have a quick look at the interface. On the top left are your time acceleration settings. The first icon on the top right is your battery capacity followed by your diesel fuel indicator. As we already know, a U-boat has two different engines, diesel and electric. Why? Easy. There's no air underwater and diesels need air to function. They also are very noisy, so hiding underwater would be pointless if you can be heard from miles away. So while diving, the electric engines take over. Their batteries are recharged by the diesel engines while you're traveling on the surface. Next is the air quality indicator. The longer you dive, the lower it drops, which limits the time you can spend underwater. Discipline indicates your crew's level of resilience. A disciplined crew works better under stress. They can function indefinitely though, so you need to send them on vacation once in a while. Then there are reputation points. They allow you to research stuff in the HQ and grant promotions to members of your crew. The final icon is your budget, which enables you to buy supplies and upgrades for your submarine. You get them from Hans inside the warehouse. Upgrades are marked with green arrows. More will become available as the campaign progresses. Now some of the main U-boat controls follow. The telegraph is for setting forward or reverse speed. The depth meter controls how deep you dive. Descending beyond the orange marking may put your boat at risk. Then there's the rudder to manually steer your boat left and right. The last icon opens the map where you can plan your course and navigate. And that's what we want to do. But we can't leave the harbor without picking up a mission first. So we talk to the guy near the gangway. U-boats usually got assigned certain areas to patrol where single enemy ships, convoys or battle groups are assumed to pass through. Sometimes one submarine would spot a group and pass on its location to other subs. They would then join up and attack together. This was called Rudeltaktik or Wolfsrudeltaktik. The latter is derived from the English term Wolfpack. Our first assignment is a standard patrol. I pick the closest patrol area so we don't have to travel beyond Scotland and Ireland to reach our destination. Now we're ready to go. I set the boat to Kleine Fahrt, which means ahead slow, and we're on our way. Press M to open the map. Just click anywhere you want to go and your crew will navigate the boat there. To plot a course with several waypoints, use the shift key. Don't worry, the crew will steer your sub out of the harbor safely, no matter where you set your first waypoint. Your fuel indicator on the top also shows how much fuel you're using at the given speed. Going fast also decreases your range. So we march towards our patrol area at a slower pace. We hit the time compression and wait until we reach the open sea. Between Helgoland and Wangeroge, our Wache, that's the crew on the bridge ordered to look out for ships, spots smoke on the horizon. As you can see, it appeared on the edge of the max sight circle. Since the Earth is a sphere, the first thing you spot of another ship is smoke from its funnel. In this case, we can be sure it's a friendly, so we don't investigate further and speed up time again. As we reach our destination, we plot a search course within the area by holding shift again to place waypoints. We also want to contact BDU, Befehlshaber der U-Boote, Central U-Boat Command, to report that we reached our destination. This nets us a few hundred bucks of budget. Jawohl, so geht das. Aber schau dir mal das an. Karl-Heinz mangelt den Aal anstatt zu arbeiten. That's right, Herr Kaloin. We can't send our message because Karl-Heinz Schuster, the radio officer, is chilling out on his bunk. We click on him and tell him to man the radio station. As soon as he arrives, we're able to send our message, which we immediately do. Now we accelerate the time again and wait until our crew spots something of interest, like a big fat freighter for us to sink. A while later, we receive the message that Germany is now at war with the United Kingdom. This means we're allowed to attack their freighters if the opportunity arises. Shortly after, just after turning south, 
we spot smoke on the horizon, just like at the beginning of our patrol. But this time we're on the open sea between Norway and the United Kingdom and it could possibly be a target. I use the tap menu to sound the alarm. Then we send the position of the spotted ship to BDU. Afterwards we order Schuster to man the hydrophone. Also we make sure he has the support of at least one crew member to maximize its range. The hydrophone is a very sensitive, rotatable listening device used to track ships by the sound of their propellers. The diesels are too loud, so we dive to periscope depth and slow down our boat to kleine Fahrt. This minimizes the noise we make so we can hear other vessels better. The hydrophone would function even better at 30 meters of depth with our engine stopped. But its performance right now is good enough for the situation. As you can see, the contact is marked inaccurate and could be anywhere within a radius of 5 kilometers. But Karl-Heinz and his helper quickly pick up its sound emissions and pinpoint its precise position. Now, let's first find out in which direction it is moving. I use the marker tool to place a marker near the contact. Then I just pick it up and as you can see it snaps right onto the middle of the freighter. We let some time pass and place some more of them. Three are enough to draw a line projecting the contact's estimated course. For our convenience he will pass right in front of us. I draw another line orthogonal to the freighter's path to see where to position us best. And that's what we do. We place our boat in roughly 1.3 kilometers of distance towards the projected path. Torpedoes explode best if they hit at a 90 degree angle. So this means we're at the perfect spot. Rule of thumb, everything below 2 kilometers is a promising range to fire torpedoes. We wait until the freighter is around a kilometer away from where both lines meet. Now it's time to calculate a torpedo solution. There are different ways. I show you the one I think is the easiest. The skipper is already in the conning tower and operates the attack periscope. One click on the crosshair next to him and we're right there. Control the periscope with WASD. The arrows on the right let you extend and retract it. The right icon on the top adjusts the view and moves us closer to the lens. I zoom in with a right click, a left click locks the freighter in the center. There are four steps until we have a good firing solution. First one is to identify the vessel. Let's open the ID book and search for a matching silhouette. This freighter has two big masts and two smaller ones on the rear, which identifies him as Empire Tower class. We now know its dimensions, which is useful for the rest of the calculations. Step 2 is to estimate its speed. As we click the stopwatch, our lock becomes a little bit more flexible and we can move the periscope again. I place the reticle in front of the vessel. The moment the ship's bow touches the center, I start the clock. Now we wait until the stern hits the reticle and press stop. Set. There it is. 7 knots. Step 3 is the target's course. We will use the angle on bow method. This means we need to measure the angle at which our boat appears to be as seen by someone standing on the bow of the target's ship. We open the map again and pick the protractor tool. We start at the center of our boat. From there we draw a line straight to the center of our target. Then we continue in the direction it is going. Conveniently we already drew a corresponding line earlier on. And there is our angle. 67 degrees. While we're at it, we also memorize the distance to our target, which is 1.4 kilometers, so we can double check later. Back in the periscope view, all we need to do is to put in our 67 degrees. Since we are to the left of the target, I set the angle on the left side of the instrument. Set again and we're done. You can now see the target's real heading here under course. Fourth and last step is distance. What we need to do is to rotate the knob with Q and E so that the highest mast matches the sea level of the ship. Upwards or downwards doesn't matter. The stern mast seems to be highest from our perspective, so we put it on the waterline. It says 1.5 kilometers, but we measured 1.4 on the map. So I manually put in the average of 1450 meters. That's it. 
we got a pretty good solution now, I guess. Top, mach die alle warm und dann Feuer. Exactly, Herr Kaloin. Since we set crew management to minimal, our crew already warmed up the torpedoes. We know that because they are red. Warming up torpedoes greatly reduces the chance of a dud shot. We flood tube one and two. If you prepare more than one torpedo, you can also set the dispersion. This means the second torpedo will follow the first with a slight offset to the side. This way at least one hit should be very likely. One torpedo would suffice here, but let's fire both just because we can. Torpedoes away. Both approaches look good on the map. Let's switch back to the periscope to observe the impact. Two good hits. The freighter will go down quickly. In case you were wondering why we casually nuked a Norwegian ship, because that's a tutorial. That's all. In a real campaign, we would have inspected the ship first. But since the freighter was headed directly towards the UK, it was very likely he targeted a port there, which means he's fair game anyway. Afterwards, we pick up some survivors, including two officers, which boosts our reputation a bit. Since there's no space for the remaining survivors of the second boat, we leave them with some supplies and continue our patrol. Und was ist mit deiner Pressluft, du Torschkopf? Oh yes, thanks again, Herr Kaloin. Remember the compressed air thing we talked about in the beginning? We're down to 66%, which is why we turn on the diesel compressor. Always keep your compressed air at 100%. Alright, now you know all the basics to go on your first patrol. Check out this awesome Herr Kaloin shirt in my shop to support the channel, link is in the description below, or learn how to fly with my air combat basics tutorial. Thanks for watching and see you on deck.